Leo from the Interdisciplinary Studies Department, and welcome to the Public Intellectual Lecture Series of Far Eastern University. The Public Intellectual Lecture Series is a platform where students can engage critical issues um, and listen to the experts that can provide well-rounded research in terms of opinions and perspectives. Today's session involves indigenous peoples of the Philippines, as well as the challenges and issues that they face. We have here today um, Attorney Jennifer Tauli Corpus, the Program Coordinator for the Indigenous Peoples' Rights and Policy Advocacy Program. Thank you very much, Attorney Corpus, for joining us for today's session. Uh, thank you very much also, Leo, for inviting me, and thank you for the opportunity to provide some, um, as you said, opinions and perspectives on Indigenous Peoples. Thank you. So, Attorney Corpus, before we begin these, the, the discussion, perhaps you can provide us a brief overview of the research and advocacies that, that are being done by your group, especially with regards to Indigenous peoples' rights, as well as their political and economic well-being. We have a whole range of different uh, research endeavors. Um, so sometimes we focus on the issues, but most of the time, what we would like to do is actually highlight how indigenous peoples are able to contribute to solving a lot of the problems in the Philippines and also worldwide. So one example would be um, uh, forest management practices and how that has maintained the health of the forests and the plants and animals living within the forests. Um, another example would be, um, um, for instance, um, looking at uh, small-scale mining and whether uh, it's uh, destructive to the environment and uh, whether it's um, you know something that still follows the customary uh, practices of um, you know uh, traditional artisanal mining and hence non-destructive <laughs> thank you so attorney Carpus, just to start the discussion um, perhaps you can give us a working definition of the in, of the term indigenous peoples and who belong to these communities because recent events or the past few years saw an uptick in terms of awareness because now we see members of the indigenous peoples communities going to manila campaigning for their rights um, um critiquing government policy um especially with regards to militarization and development and um as I said, maybe development or um, destructive development. Perhaps you can give us an overview. What does it mean? And also um, why the indigenous peoples communities are vital when it comes to discourse on nation and development. Yes. Well, um, using layman's language as much as I can, um, indigenous peoples are normally those who still maintain their culture. Um, they have to identify as indigenous peoples and there has to be a community that identifies them as members of their community. Um, there is usually a special relationship to the land. So it's not your normal land ownership where it's an individual mm -hmm. uh, relationship. For indigenous peoples, it's usually a collective relationship to the land. So there's collective ownership and usually they can't sell it. They can just pass it on to the different generations. They view themselves as stewards of nature. So in the Philippines, um, it's actually quite a sizable population. There are around 50 mil 15 million, so that's a, that's a huge chunk of the population of the Philippines. And there are around 100 to 120 different indigenous groups in the Philippines. Um, as to um, why they are vital to the, the nation, well, they have maintained a lot of our green areas, the mountains, the, the rivers, the seas, the waters, as well as um, the culture. So what defines us as Filipinos? It's the multitude of cultures within the Philippines and indigenous peoples you know, represent a huge um, uh, percentage of that culture, that cultural diversity. Thank you. So it seems that the primary role of the IP, of the indigenous peoples communities, it's more of preservation no? and conservation of identity and even of the environment. But as I mentioned, there seems to be a there seems to be conflict and turmoil among in terms of um, how the IPs or the situation of the IPs in the Philippines. Um, perhaps you can give us a brief uh, background or overview of the situations of the IPs in the Philippines, as well as the challenges and issues they face. Well, uh, because. Indigenous peoples have been so successful in conserving their territories, their lands. Um, a lot of the pressure uh, is, uh, well, a lot of pressure is put on them because, um, you know, many factors, the population is growing. Mm -hmm. 
not just in the Philippines but in other countries. So, so they are looking for resources to exploit and um, since indigenous peoples have done so well in conserving their areas, this is where the remaining resources can be found. So trees, even water, mm -hmm. mineral resources. And because of this pressure, there's a tendency, you know, to overlook the agency of indigenous peoples or mm -hmm. their right consent or not mm -hmm. to these types of development projects happening within their communities. And so without their knowledge, they get um, evicted mm -hmm. <laughs> from their lands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and when they resist, sometimes uh, they get militarized mm -hmm. in order uh, because the government is intent on protecting the corporations that are inside the communities. You mentioned a particular term, development. And I think that's something that really needs to be discussed or elaborate on, elaborated on given the discourse of the indigenous peoples. Because if we look at popular perception, for example, you have on one hand, we, we view there is an attempt or there's this push to preserve their identity. And then on the other, there's this critique. But how will we, how, how, what about the discourse of development? How will development come to these areas? It's as if there's a conflict between understanding how can we preserve their, or how can we help them preserve their identity, their culture, and at the same time, provide them opportunities for them to, up, to uplift their situations. Well, you know what? You raise a very important issue because frequently indigenous peoples are um, labeled as anti-development, but this is not the case at all. It is merely that indigenous peoples want to be involved in the development process. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to have a voice uh, to identify what types of development are appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. You know, earlier I mentioned the collective relationship to the land. Mm -hmm. It's also a very far, uh, you know, a, a very long view mm -hmm. of things. Uh, for example, the Native Americans, they have this thing that uh, everything they do, they have to think of the seventh generation, mm -hmm. how their impact, uh, their actions now would impact the seventh generation after them. And we have something similar among the indigenous peoples in the Philippines. So I think this is something that we can, uh, you know, that we could leverage um, in, in terms of de uh, defining what types of development would be sustainable. Mm -hmm. So indigenous peoples are not anti-development, they're very much pro-development, but it's a sustainable type of development. I'll give you an example. Um, in my hometown in Busao, uh, there was a proposal for a windmill, mm -hmm. but it was, a, it was um, a proposal that didn't enjoy any consultation mm -hmm among the community. So they didn't really know what the impacts would be, mm -hmm. and so they rejected it. Mm -hmm. But when you ask them whether they would like this kind of energy in their communities, and when you're able to give them enough uh, information, they would, in fact, mm -hmm. approve mm -hmm. <laughs> of that kind of development. Oh. Yeah. Because I was also, th uh, we were, um, it's a critical point, because if I'm not mistaken, most of the members of the IP communities, they're mostly farmers, right? So they actually form a critical part of food production in their respective areas. And if you think about it, they're, they're producing food without harming the environment. But in terms of development, you mentioned something about participation. No? So is, there, is it really supposed to be conflicting, this notion of development and conservation? Or is there a way for, from the IP perspective that we can balance both? Because as you mentioned, nobody wants to just neglect development. We want our lives to improve, regardless of whether we are from the IP community or from, um, from the general population. But how can we balance this perspective of development and at the same time not be exploitative no? and still follow this process of consultation and especially respecting the rights of the indigenous peoples? The, the very critical thing there is to listen to indigenous peoples and to trust that they have expertise about what the land can and cannot take. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this can be done through participation. A lot of laws require mm -hmm. participation, right? And uh, in the participation of indigenous peoples, they bring their, you know, their visions of sustainable development mm -hmm. into play. And I think this is something also that the government wants. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be developing in a way that you know you consume the resources prematurely. Mm -hmm. So there's a, in a way, there's a false um, dichotomy. Mm -hmm that indigenous peoples are anti-development, government want mm -hmm. very bad development projects. Mm -hmm. I think there's a meeting ground if only they would uh, you know, listen to each other. Mm 
you mentioned something about development projects. And I think one of the development projects that heavily impact the IPs no, is mining. I think mining is a very big issue. And even before the Duterte administration, there were issues on mining and how it displaced um, the, uh, the various communities. So can you please give us a brief, perhaps, background or overview of how the indigenous peoples view mining? And again, is it really necessary to engage? I mean, do, you, do the IPs believe that mining should not happen? Or are there ways to determine whether it is necessary or how we, how we can meet in the middle when it comes to mining? Well, uh, for mining, a lot of the issues um, surrounding mining and indigenous peoples have to do with precisely what we mentioned earlier, lack of participation and the lack of uh, voice of indigenous peoples in uh, decision making whether mining should go ahead or not. The other aspect is that a lot of these mines are put up in sacred mm. areas. Mm. And these sacred areas of indigenous peoples, they're usually mountains or you know, unique uh, formations in nature. Um, when you have these sacred areas, they are usually critical to how the indigenous peoples take care mm. of their territories. Okay, so, um, and that's why it's become so controversial, mm -hmm. you know. What would you think if someone came up and dug up, came mm -hmm. and dug up your uh, graves or your, mm -hmm. you know, your church, mm -hmm. and just put a hole there and uh, extracted um, minerals? So those are the two things: the impact on sacred areas and the lack of participation. But I don't think that indigenous peoples are just, you know, opposed to mining just for the sake mm -hmm. of it. It, uh, I think there are some areas uh, that could be open to mining. And I gave you the example mm -hmm. of my community. Mm -hmm. This is a traditionally practiced uh, uh, livelihood mm -hmm. in, uh, among the Igorot and also among the Kalinga. And um, there's a way for them to do it mm -hmm. without destroying the environment. And I think people should be listening to indigenous peoples mm -hmm. uh, on this. But uh, just to um, append something, you know recently the, the landslides that happened mm -hmm. in Itogon, mm -hmm. um, and it exposed something, right? Because the people, the indigenous peoples there in the area, mm -hmm. they were doing small scale mining mm -hmm. in a former mine site by Benguet Corporation. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the heavy rains, and some say because of the extensive digging, mm -hmm. there were devastating um, you know, landslides. Many people were killed. Mm -hmm. no? But the response of the government was to immediately prohibit small scale mining. There's a moratorium, mm -hmm. right? And so for indigenous peoples who have been doing this since time immemorial as part mm -hmm. of their culture, they view it as a, as a uh, violation of their rights. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the answer to your question. Not all mining is bad. Mm -hmm. We just have to be listening to the indigenous peoples. Yes, and that's where I would like to also build up on that uh, perspective because now we're talking about environmental destruction. Because um, apparently, if we follow, if we can actually study the tradition and cultures of, indi of the indigenous peoples, there seems to be a sustainable way of doing things. No? Sustainable farming, because I remember one of the things that I learned with regards to the IPs, ka the, the Kaingin system is not necessarily destructive. It is first um, when the I, when for example the Mangyans and even the Igorots when they did it, it didn't result into the denudation of forests. It's in fact very it's sustainable because of population and the strategies. But given that, now, as you mentioned, most of what the IPs are doing in terms of economic activity, they're small scale. So to what extent or how to what extent did environmental destruction brought about by exploitative practices? To what extent did it impact the IPs in their areas? Oh, well, it's a very big impact. And one emer emerging issue now beyond mining is this large scale agribusiness. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've heard several pronouncements from the president uh, mm -hmm. uh, expressing favor for palm oil. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a way, this is. Uh, this is an approach um, to reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. But when you go to indigenous communities where the oil palm plantations are, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's heartbreaking. We went to a community where we see high levels of malnutrition and um, mm -hmm. stunting among the children because when you have these plantations, they just, uh, they're very toxic. They kill off um, their other crops. Mm -hmm. 
normally and you know um, so there's a huge impact of um, poorly thought out development projects such as large mining large dams and large agribusiness um, the things that indigenous peoples were able to do at a small scale in order to feed themselves and keep themselves healthy mm-hmm. are now you know affected they can't be carried out anymore mm-hmm. so um, so uh, there's a need really mm-hmm. to listen to them so that um, whatever development projects can be carried out properly without affecting mm-hmm. you know all these small scale enterprises of indigenous peoples i also remember because as you were saying about um, the conversion of ag- of ancestral lands into large scale agri plantations agri business plantations i think the bananas i think and then palm oil pineapples i was i remember that there was an issue with land reform and the ips because on one hand, the the government was saying, okay, we will implement land reform. I think it was in Boraca, if I'm not mistaken. We will um, we will implement land reform. We will sequester these lands and then redistribute it for you. And then I think there was some also some problematic views regarding that issue. Perhaps uh-huh. you can elaborate on that. Yes. Well, to begin with, you know, land reform is a very good thing, mm-hmm. especially for farmers who... Um, you know who practice um you know your non indigenous farming well non indigenous people's kinds of farming mm. it's very good but for indigenous peoples you know what the one thing mm. that I- that uh, most destroys the 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 community mm. it's when individual land titles are given out mm. and uh, when there is the potential for you know these very poor communities to sell off mm. to sell the land so while it's um it's a very good uh you know, it's a very good um, pro- uh, program of government land reform. It may not be the most appropriate for indigenous peoples mm-hmm. because of again this collective view of things, mm-hmm. and because of the tendency, because of their uh, in their uh, their state in life, mm-hmm. the poverty prevalent in indigenous communities. Um, there might be unintended consequences. Mm-hmm. You know, the lands might be lost because of the uh, the 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 ability to sell or to sell the land instead of you know ancestral domains are non inalienable mm-hmm. so which also brings me to my next question because you were you were saying that in terms of so the IP, if based on also my understanding the ips in the philippines they often view land as a collective not even property if i, if I remember it, it was makling bulag who said that we do not own the land how can you own something that will live longer than you right and it is very painful for the IPs to even contemplate selling or moving out of land. No? But now you also have some of the IPs moving to Manila or going to Manila, establishing schools. And also, but some of them are also brought to Manila not because of their desire to integrate, but because that's a different issue altogether, but because of militarization. No? I think it especially in the southern Philippines, there's this very big issue and it's all tied up again, I think, to mining and then tourism. I was thinking, what, uh, what do the IPs think of, the, of these particular conflicts, militarization and even the wars on ancestral domain and the conflict with regards to development? You know, we had a uh, indigenous youth summit, a national indigenous youth summit last week. Mm-hmm. And one of the main things that the children were bringing up was the problem with militarization. Mm-hmm. You know, if they had a choice, they would never leave their ancestral domains. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, some would go out to study, but many go back because um, of the need for community, for the culture. So this is a very big problem, um, the militarization, because it drives out the people from their lands. And, you know, for indigenous peoples, when you uproot them mm-hmm. um, forcibly, um, uh, you know, force them to uh, leave the community and go to an unfamiliar place. Mm-hmm. You know, it has a psychological impact. It's like a trauma mm-hmm. for indigenous peoples. So, um, and the the other thing that I've heard is that, um, you know, much as um, the situation becomes unbearable in communities of indigenous mm-hmm. peoples, there are some who still refuse to leave mm-hmm. because they view this as, an, uh, you know, people making an opportunity for... Um, because when they leave, others would be able to come inside and claim the lands. Mm-hmm. So it's a essential being like caught in a <laughs> rock between the a rock, rock and, and a hard, hard place, place yeah. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Because you leave 
because of the unbearable conditions, and then you d you try, you know, you. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, that's also what I'm interested because, of course, uh, the IPs do not want to leave their land; they don't want to abandon it. But there's also this question on how these things, militarization, national uh, environment destruction, forced unsustainable destructive development like mining, uh, like uh, um, unsustainable mining, does it attack the fabric of unity among the IPs? Does it, for example, foment dissent? Does it lead to the IPs, you know, going against each other? That's something that I think has come, that's a question that comes up, especially with the recent events of, uh, and challenges of the IPs. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's very classic. It's a very classic strategy, divide and conquer. And in fact, we see that more and more in some of the projects that, uh, you know, that come into communities without the consent of the communities. You see the companies hiring community facilitators who are from the same tribe. Mm -hmm. And that results in great divisions within the community. Um, we had a partner community in Agusan del Sur, um, uh, the Mamanwa. And you know, it was just heartbreaking to see the divisions within the community because the the, the mining uh, corporation had taken on a lot of the community members uh, as part of the the company, mm -hmm. and their goal, their 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 main goal, was to get the other members of the community to agree to the mining. Mm -hmm. And so you see uh, conflicts within clans, within communities, mm -hmm. and as you said, this. This just it destroys the sense of community, mm -hmm. no? It uh, and um, uh, just to cite, there are some um, uh, you know rulings at mm -hmm. in the international level as well as in national courts that say that uh, you know culture is an essential part of mm -hmm. the um, you know of the community, mm -hmm. and if you do something that disrupts the culture, mm -hmm. you're killing the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because. I think some of them actually utilize indig some of them appropriate indigenous people's culture to attack the IPs and force them to either accommodate or concede territory. What do, what do, do you have any information or perspectives regarding that? Well, one of the things that reached the national media mm -hmm. was the use of uh, the fabric ah, yeah. in uh, Ifugao. And you know, one of the ways to get indigenous peoples to back off from their protests is to, in a way, threaten them. So we heard of um, cases where some activists, some indigenous activists, were sent the death blankets. So that's one wow. way that culture has been appropriated in order to quell mm -hmm. the dissent within indigenous communities. So, um, and of course, you have all these, um, because they know within indigenous mm. clans and families, mm. usually the eldest has, you know, they are, they are very well respected. Mm. And sometimes what they say is, is law. Okay. Mm. So we've seen, um, you know, co uh, corporations taking advantage of this, uh, you know, this sort of cultural norm. Mm. And so they, they try very hard mm. to get at the heads of the clans and the mm. families. And once they get them, the rest of the clan falls. Yeah. Which is something about indigenous activists and they encounter harassment. No? Um, have you any incidences or events wherein the government exercise state or coercive powers to harass or prevent um, the struggle of the IPs or to hinder the struggles of the IPs? Well, many, many times. <laughs> Many times. Um, in fact, one of the main problems faced by indigenous peoples worldwide is uh, criminalization. Um, well, criminalization, which includes uh, killing and harassment of indigenous uh, activists. Um, and we see the reports year after year of human rights defenders being killed, a significant up to 40% or even up to 70% are indigenous peoples. Yeah. So um, you see false charges being mm -hmm. filed against them. And in many countries, you see the population in the prison. Mm -hmm. They're disproportionately mm -hmm. indigenous. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly those who are um, you know, opposing certain projects. So um, I mean, I don't mean to sound <laughs> uh, dark and uh, dreary, mm -hmm. but um, this is what happens. No? And um, of course, indigenous peoples are trying to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, by providing sanctuary, for mm -hmm. example, and uh, you know, just uh, trying to address it. If I'm not mistaken, red tagging I think is very prevalent and very common as a common tool of harassment for the IPs, right? Um, why is it that the government views, for example, they'd say, ah, these they're fighting because they were influenced by the communists or by the NPAs. Can you elaborate on that? This strikes close to home, <laughs> actually, because uh, a close family member mm -hmm. was put on a list of um, alleged communists filed by the DOJ. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once the government um, tags you as a uh, either a rebel, mm -hmm. a sympathizer, a communist, or, you know, um, or you've heard the term masa, mm -hmm. then you're fair game. Mm -hmm. It's in a way um, removing the human rights protections mm -hmm. for people. Um, so once you're tagged, it's like a hit list, basically. Mm -hmm. When uh, when you're put on a list, it's a hit list. Even if they say no, no, this is just you know a listing of um, of people who are potential <laughs> or <laughs> alleged communists. But in practice, it becomes a hit list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. You're completely right. This is another way of um, harassing mm -hmm. and uh, quelling the dissent of indigenous peoples. Because I also remember as well. I think for the Lumads who went to Manila or Lakbaya. No? I think whenever the military goes to their place, anyone who's who, who tries to ask questions, they're immediately tagged as communists or communist sympathizers. No? I think that's why I was wondering, no? why is it so easy for the government to immediately see the IP who is struggling for determination, for for their rights? They're immediately branded as com they're immediately branded as communists. Why is it? Why is there this dynamic between? The IP who is assert the IPs who are asserting their rights and their relations to communists. No, why is there something like that? No? Well, um, you know, uh, the current um, I, I've heard it called the civil war mm -hmm. or insurgency within the Philippines. It's uh, of course it's um, it's a guerrilla war. Mm -hmm. So um, many of the rebels mm -hmm. they don't you know form huge companies of you know armed uh, armed components mm -hmm. and parade them out in the open mm -hmm. of course they have to hide and you know these very remote areas are in indigenous communities ah, so there are studies uh, in fact that say that 92 percent of rebel bases are within mm -hmm. ancestral domains of indigenous peoples and you know the military is saying that 75 percent of the NPA are lumad and so they mm -hmm. became they become a convenient uh, scapegoat yeah. so also, with regards to that, because you were mentioning something about there is a need for consultation. Uh, you should not enter or ex even ex and especially exploit um, NUMAD area, um, IP areas just because you want development. Or, or the argument there is because I remember the Chico Dam gave four during the Marcos regime. Right? They were saying, why are the IP, why are the Igorots no, hindering the dam when it will benefit everyone? No? And also, again, you're, there seems to be an issue, under, uh, an underlying issue here about why, the ego, why people, you know, why the indigenous peoples should be consulted. Why, um, how can the IPs, how we should we understand this notion of self-determination of the IPs? Is it something that we as, because there would be this the, the com an, a compelling argument that they're fighting for, a min for the rights of the minority, why should, they why should we suffer so that they could but okay. there's this view eh, but there are only a few people why should we always accommodate them and vice versa so how can we navigate this understanding of self-determination well you know under international law mm -hmm. sorry to be technical mm -hmm. but i'll try to to you know to tone it down as much as possible all people have the right to self-determination mm -hmm. so the filipino people have the right to self-determination. That's why no other foreign country can impose on us. Mm -hmm. Well, technically. Mm -hmm. Yes, technically. But yeah. um, and indigenous peoples, you know, from the term, are also regarded as peoples. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they have a territory. They have uh, in so, uh, uh, social, political, political, cultural, judicial systems, mm -hmm. and um, they have people. 
So they are people, and they also have the right to self-determination, which is basically just the right to you know, determine what type of development. Y yeah. you, know, you determine your identity, your political status, as well as the type of development that you would like to take place in your territory. So um, uh, that's, that's uh, the long and short of <laughs> it. <laughs> they should have self-determination because that's what, that's what all people have. Mm -hmm. If we really want to be, uh, to be equal, mm -hmm. you know, to have equality and non-discrimination, mm -hmm. then this is something that should be recognized mm -hmm. and respected. You mentioned discrimination because it's something I think that still needs to be elaborated on because again the ips as you mentioned the ips can be found around the philippines all throughout the philippines and as even in the in even in especially in manila because of the recent events because and now there's this view that when the ips when they come to manila it's either because they want something or they because most, i mean for example in term here in manila there's this understanding, instead of viewing, the, for example, the Bajaos as a noble, seafaring people in the, the South, they're now being seen as beggars. And I think discrimination plays a very big role in that perspective. How do the IPs see these events, especially when now they're being seen as something different? And since you're different, you're discriminated against. No? Well, <laughs> you're in fact bringing back some memories, <laughs> some very bad memories from the recent elections, if mm. you recall. Mm. Uh, senatorial candidate uh, Gordon, Richard Gordon, he said something about, you know, the Igorots having gone down to beg. <laughs> having gone down mm. from the mountains, mm. uh, you know, to beg. Okay. And, um, you know, it's the same thing that the Bajaos are facing. And uh, this is something Even that... Even the Aitas, the, during the Pinatubo uh, eruption, they also yes. went to the... To our, no, no, no. Yes, yeah. in fact, um, there's one story that I always tell in uh, whenever I lecture to mm. lawyers mm -hmm. um, in the context of the mandatory continuing legal education. Mm. I tell them that, you know, in Pampanga, where you find the Aitas, um, the Aitas are not welcome. They're not allowed in the regular emergency rooms mm -hmm. in hospitals. Mm -hmm. no? And one of the reasons is because you know, they, maybe they stink because they've been mm -hmm. hunting and gathering, maybe because their skin color is mm -hmm. different. But that's one of the things that the, um, you know, the officials there have had to face. Mm -hmm. And you know, very well-meaning officials, they try to address it, but uh, it's very funny how they try mm -hmm. to address it. No? They um, proposed a separate emergency room for the AITA. That's very discriminatory. <laughs> it's, yeah, so maybe the approach should be, um, you know, to preach tolerance <laughs> or just, mm -hmm. you know, respect for the different cultures because this is what makes us who we are. Mm -hmm. And the diversity of cultures is what makes us resilient mm -hmm. as a Filipino, you mm -hmm. know, as a Filipino nation. So, um, yeah, it's very unfortunate. and. Um, one of the shortcomings of the government is that they haven't managed yet to enact a law mm -hmm. that prohibits uh, discrimination on the basis of ethnicity, on mm -hmm. the basis of ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the anti-discrimination bill on mm -hmm. the basis of sexual orientation mm -hmm. and gender identity it didn't manage to pass. Mm -hmm. No, so mm -hmm. that's very sad. But what more for the anti-discrimination bill based on mm -hmm. ethnic identity? Which is an important thing because you mentioned medical access or access to hospitals which brings me back brings me to the question in terms of government social services do ips have access to social services like education health and is it something that they are able to fully enjoy again without experiencing discrimination or attacks against their identity and culture yeah this is something that's also very raw mm. as um you know, demonstrated by the comments of the the indigenous youth in our national youth summit. Um, yeah, you know, there's a special term used by some government agencies, uh, GIDA. Have you heard of it? No. Geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. No, mm -hmm. um, it's the their term way. Itself is problematic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but it's used to refer, and it's mostly indigenous peoples because they live in very remote remote places where there are no schools, mm -hmm. no, no government schools, mm -hmm. there are no health centers. And so uh, this was the basis for asking for reforms in the four Ps, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Pantawid Pamilyang Pilipino. 
um, because one of the conditionalities for the cash transfer is that you're able to attend 80% of the classes and mm -hmm. able to um, have your checkups. But if you don't have any mm -hmm. uh, health centers within the community or any schools, mm -hmm. it makes it really difficult. No? So um, in terms of, you, d you asked mm -hmm. about access. Of course they have access, but it's to their traditional medicines. Mm -hmm. uh, but access to the mainstream hospitals and health centers, it's very limited. And then you have this funny thing now where the government, based on a study uh, conducted with the EU, I think, prohibited home-based birthing. You know, They were encouraging facility-based births in order to uh, lower maternal and child mortality. But uh, the funny thing is the way that the LGUs interpreted it is to penalize mothers and midwives and children who were uh, you know who who had home based births so that's uh, another funny thing because can you imagine i heard a story about um, from the batak community in palawan um, there was a young mother who was about to give birth but the hospital was 25 kilometers away through rough roads mm -hmm. so how do you force it do you risk it you know the mother might die along the way there are no and you know you have habal habal uh, <laughs> and oh you have the stretcher <laughs> yeah but how can you transport a, a pregnant woman who is about to give birth that way so yeah there are a lot of things that need to be recalibrated in order to address or to respond to the needs and the context of indigenous peoples which is interesting because you were mentioning you were talking about how in fact the indigenous peoples were being penalized for exercising their traditions precisely in that instance wherein um, they were using traditional medicine but because they were being imposed modern views or not even modern but more of um, western views you will be penalized if you're a midwife or a traditional birth pr uh, practitioner no? which brings me to my question in terms of legal access because we're talking about several things like ancestral domain we were talking about now being penalized for uh, for doing something that's integral to your culture and of course in terms of protecting themselves against harassment and militarization how have the IPs um, engaged government in terms of the legal processes organization goes a, a long way mm -hmm. and I think uh, indigenous communities have been doing a good job in organizing themselves mm -hmm. and linking up with other indigenous communities who are similarly situated. Um, there, uh, well, under our national laws also, there are mandatory representatives mm -hmm. in the local government and sometimes they are able to help advance the causes of these mm -hmm. uh, indigenous communities. Um, and of course, then you have um, mm -hmm. uh, organizations that extend legal uh, assistance. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, now we're hoping that even the Integrated Bar of the Philippines would be able to extend legal assistance because of this, um, it's sort of mandatory legal aid mm -hmm. for all new lawyers. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it's, it's not very easy to come by, but indigenous peoples have been strong in organizing themselves and reaching out to people who could help them. Which is an important point, important point because you're mentioning indigenous people, so it's not just not just because you're Bajau, Maranao. It means peop the indigenous community, regardless of your clan or your ethno-linguistic group, you're now uniting towards each other. No? And I think that's a very important development. No? So I guess re in re related to that view, no, since the IPs are now organizing themselves, no? or in fact, they've been organizing themselves in time, since time immemorial. No? No, it's not as if it's a recent occurrence. No? But what do you think are the just to conclude this discussion no, just to sum everything up no, what do you think are the government actions or government legislation that should be passed to address the issues of the indigenous peoples and more importantly why should we why people no, regard even though we're not members of the indigenous peoples communities why we need to be engaged in pushing both government and encouraging the ips because the assumption there is we're different eh? But in fact, we're all Filipinos. So um, in a way, why and how can we help in the struggles of the IPs, especially when it comes to government legislation and support? 
Well, I'll take the, the second question you ask. I'm, I'm going to answer that first. And it's, um, well, I've, gi I've given several reasons already, but one of the popular things that we always say is that, you know, a whole body, which is the entire Philippines, cannot be considered well if one part of the body is not well. No? And this is reflected in now um, what the UN has developed, the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, the goals to enable sustainable development. Their theme is leaving no one behind. Because if you leave these um, communities, the indigenous communities behind, then you know, y you're not going to get where you want to go. No? And um, in terms of the changes from government that we want to see, um, you know, the election was recently yeah. concluded. And typically, what indigenous peoples do is we uh, develop a legislative agenda uh, for the incoming lawmakers. And one, the top, one of the top things is um, uh, you know, to enact an alternative mining bill, you know, something that rec respects the right of the people and the right of indigenous peoples. Because as it is now, it trumps the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act. It trumps, you know, protections for Indigenous peoples, and it provides. I mean, when mining is allowed, it provides for a very small share in the benefits. Um, the others are well, um, Indigenous peoples' education, because um, you know it's a different kind of education that Indigenous peoples need. It's not just the four R's that we learn in school. It's also education about their culture culturally sensitive education. Um, then the other is to recognize that indigenous peoples are doing a good job in taking care of their environment. And this is not reflected in the protected area system of the government. Um, so one attempt is through the in indigenous conserved areas bill, which is uh, basically to recognize what indigenous peoples have been doing since time immemorial. No? And um, another, well, maybe one of the last items on the list, would be um, something that uh, uh, that protects the traditional knowledge you know, of indigenous peoples, because um, you know um, many designers nowadays <laughs> they really like for some for some reason the fabrics produced by indigenous peoples, and you, sometimes you see them in New York Fashion Week. Even Hollywood has appropriated yes indigenous culture from the Philippines e too. Yeah, Translate. exactly, exactly. And so um, that's one of the things we've been hearing from, from the communities. They need a law that would protect them against all of this misappropriation of elements of their culture. Um, so it's a long list. <laughs> I can go on. So I can go on, but um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer. So just to conclude this session, uh, it is imperative that we look into the discourse of the indigenous peoples and their struggles. No? It's not because of charity, but rather because we are part of one big community. And in fact, if we look at their contributions to the preservation of both our culture, our identity, and our environment, and their continued protection no? of these things that really matter to our lives as Filipinos, it is imperative that we support their struggles and become one with them in struggling for a true and liberated Philippines. Thank you very much, Attorney Corpus, for joining us today. And thank you for watching this session of the Public Intellectual Lecture Series. Good day.